Psalm 77, beginning in verse 1. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and He will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I considered the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord, will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the night, to the years, years of, to the years of the right hand of Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You with your arm redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. This is the word of the, of the Lord. Be to God. Amen. You may be seated. By every estimation, over 50 psalms, so that's over a third of the Psalter, over 50 psalms are psalms of lament, lament. That is prayers of complaint and petition to God in the midst of hardship. And here we are again. Our psalmist finds himself in a dark place struggling to move from anguish to hope, from doubt to confidence. Now, let's be honest, how many of you, when James was reading this psalm, thought, gosh, another sad and dreary psalm, Chris? Really? That's not what I was hoping for today when I rolled out of bed. And why do we keep revisiting psalms like this? I mean, why not just preach maybe one representative lament psalm each summer, you know, to sort of cover the sadness of the summer. For those of us who are preaching, the repetition of these laments is difficult too because there's the temptation, not a good one, to say something new and innovative each time about how we should respond to troubles. I wrestled with that this week. Is there anything new to say here that hasn't already been said about how we should respond when we're walking through hardship? By God's grace, I have nothing innovative to tell you. <laughs> Instead, we'll hear the age-old wisdom of God's Word. Nothing new. You're probably not going to hear anything new today that you haven't heard before, most likely. But what you'll get is something sure and steady, and solid, because it comes from God's Word. There is great value in returning to these laments every few weeks. Such repetition teaches us something about the normal rhythm of a life of faith, that this life, even the Christian life, is not lived by skipping from mountaintop to mountaintop from one spiritual high and success to the next spiritual high and success, the very frequency of psalms like this suggests that seasons in the valley, even extended seasons in the valley, are not abnormal, but rather a real and necessary part of life in this world. 
Listen, you're not strange or weird or different or unusual if you feel like much of your life is lived in a valley, trudging through mud, longing for small breaks in the clouds for God's light to shine through so that you can feel its warmth. There are times when God seems distant and times when he is tangibly near. And because there are just, by sheer number, so many lament psalms, this appears to be the ordinary experience, even for Christians, on pilgrimage in a fallen world. Such seasons are real, right? We know that they're real because we experience them. We feel them when we're in the valley. They're real and necessary. That's the part that we don't like as much. You mean God has designed this valley, Chris? He's designed my troubles for a purpose? Yes, for a good purpose. It's in the valley where we learn to trust and depend on Him most fully. It's in the valley where God increases the longing for our eternal rest and home. It's in the valley where God teaches us not to settle in too comfortably here in this life. Now, knowing these things, knowing all of God's purposes in our valley experiences, knowing all of this won't necessarily remove all the pain and heartache as you walk through the valley, nor will it inevitably speed your way through the valley, but it can weaken the lie of the enemy that your suffering in the valley is meaningless. There is a God in control of your life and circumstances, and he knows better than you what is best for you. Now, for the Christian, that's a comforting truth and not a threatening one. Because the brokenness and evil of the world, including our own sinful minds and hearts, all of the brokenness and sin of the world conspire to have us wander through the valley without the hope of God's presence and providence. That's the true threat. Journeying without hope of God. Admit it, life in this world is overwhelming, and oh, how we need God. And thus, psalms like this one. So, maybe you didn't want to hear another lament psalm when you rolled out of bed this morning and when you walked in these doors, but now you're realizing, wait, this is exactly where I am right now. I'm in this valley. A health crisis, grieving a loss, suffering the consequences of sin or of a bad decision, a strained relationship with a parent or with a spouse or with a child, deep anxiety over finances or the future, longing for a true friend, working through unfair criticism, emptiness, or Something that you just can't put your finger on, but you know you're in the valley, but you don't know why. The list goes on and on with hardships that are uniquely trying for each of us. You're in a valley, so what do you do? How do you respond? Well, Psalm 77 offers us some God-breathed, time-tested advice on what to do in the day of trouble, as verse 2 calls it. The day of trouble, in the valley. But before we get there, before we get to the advice, let's talk a bit more about Asaph's day of trouble here in this psalm. Asaph is the writer of this psalm, and we don't know the exact situation that has led him to pin this lament only that something has happened to him either individually or to God's people corporately, maybe some sort of national distress that has been, uh, that has had a strong effect on him personally. It's possible that they're experiencing God's discipline due to sin. So just skim your eye down to verse 9. In verse 9, Asaph mentions God's anger 
And anger is always God's settled response toward sin. So if that's the case, then the starting point would be repentance, seeking forgiveness from God, working toward reconciliation. But even once forgiveness is granted by God, the ongoing consequences of sin can still be painful enough, as you know, to produce deep agony. At the end of the day, it's not critical that we know with certainty because the real trouble for Asaph, now I need you to catch this because it's going to paint the way that we view this entire psalm. The real trouble for Asaph is not the external situation. As we'll see, the real trouble is played out internally. The core of the storm is in his own mind and heart. His longing isn't merely that God would fix his circumstances, right? Get me out of this valley, God. Now, that's a legitimate desire and a right prayer. But that's not, first and foremost, what's on Asaph's mind. What he wants is that God would give him peace of mind. Peace of mind in the valley. If I can be assured of God's favor and presence, then everything else will be okay. For the believer, perhaps the greatest anguish is feeling far from God when life is hard. So it's not just the health crisis, it's not just the financial difficulty, but are you with me in this, God? Can I still count on your love, God? Are you still at work in my life, God? Why don't I feel near to you, God? Those are the deep questions in the valley, aren't they? What do we do in that sort of trouble when our souls refuse to be comforted, as he says in verse 2? Well, Psalm 77 suggests three things that we should do in the day of trouble, three steps that we should take Now, these aren't the only things that we might do. Other psalms provide supplemental counsel. No valley is exactly the same. Nor are these three steps an easy one, two, three formula for overcoming your valley and climbing the next mountain. These take time. They build on each other. We make them regular habits, recognizing the value of persevering in the things that God calls us to do. But we do them with an assured hope that indeed God is with us in the valley and that we will feel his nearness again. So, three things you should do in a day of trouble. Three things that you should do when you're in the valley first. Continually cry out to God in prayer. Continually cry out to God in prayer. Look again at verses 1 through 3. Asaph says, I I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. It's always right in the day of trouble to cry out to God as an immediate first response. And so that's what Asaph does in verse 1. He cries out to God. And he's not quiet about it, is he? I mean, two times he says, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God. These are loud cries. But he does so trusting that God hears, the end of verse 1, that God hears and will answer him, or that God will have to answer him because he's not going to be quiet about this. Now, this is not always our inclination, is it, when we're in a day of trouble? Sometimes we give God the silent treatment in our annoyance, or we complain about his bitter providence in our lives to others. Or we numb the pain of trouble with other activities. But the reflex 
ought to be prayer made to God, addressed to God. And sometimes the only words that we can manage in these crying prayers are words like, help. Why, God? Please. Notice also that these aren't one-time cries. Verse 2, Asaph says that he seeks the Lord in the day and stretches out his hand. Now, this is just a posture of prayer, stretching out the hand, right? He stretches out his hand at night. So, day and night, day and night, without wearying. This is a continual crying out in prayer. Asaph is not giving up. He's not relenting. Have you ever cried like this in the valley? It is a posture of faith. It is a posture of faith to cry out in this way. Because you're going to God. You're speaking to God. You're praying to God, and you're not turning away from God. The suggestion to cry out in prayer is, in one sense, simple, but we dare not make it simplistic. It's the right thing to do to pray when we're in a day of trouble in the valley, but there's no guarantee of easy or immediate relief. So even as Asaph is crying out continually, his soul still refuses to be comforted, verse 2. And as he turns his mind to God, verse 3, the moans of turmoil continue to pour out. Now, a gentle word of reminder here to those of us who would be a counselor to a friend who is walking through a day of trouble. Beware of mystery-denying platitudes. You know the ones. Uh, Just pray. It'll all be all right. Yes, we should pray. But when and how God brings relief is a mystery that we are not normally privy to. Better to join them in prayer and to persevere in prayer with them, waiting for God together. So, as Asaph cries out in prayer, he's still confused by God's seeming absence. Now, I'll explain more in a moment, but verse 3 implies that he's overcome by the contrast between God's actions in the past compared to his apparent lack of action right now in the present. And that seeming dichotomy makes it painful for Asaph to even think about God. Did you catch that in verse 3? When I remember God, I moan. That's not typically what we think of as the response when we put our minds and our hearts and set them on God. But he says, when I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, that is, when I, when I really focus on who God is, my spirit faints. Love does not easily accept such distance. Have you ever felt this before? Here's the point. Prayer in the day of trouble is crucial because we take it on faith that God does hear, and that he is at work, and that we will feel his nearness again. Prayer is crucial, but it's not simplistic. It's not a tool to force God to work on our quick timetable. Often, it's through the continual habit of prayer. It's through the persevering and persisting in crying out to God in the valley. It's by means of that very repeated discipline that God does, in fact, over time draw near. Cry out to God in the day of trouble. Cry out to Him. Where else would you go for help? In sections of Scripture like this, I always think about uh, the encouraging words of the old hymn, 
dear refuge of my weary soul. I don't know if you know that hymn or if you know the words of that hymn. I would encourage you to go look it up today. I love uh, the version by Indelible Grace Music. Uh, Sandra McCracken is the one who sings on that song. But here are some of the lines. Here are some of the lines of that hymn. Now, you need to know that the setting of this hymn is in a day of trouble. And here's what it says. Yet, gracious God, where shall I flee? Thou art my only trust. And still my soul would cleave to thee, though prostrate in the dust. Can the ear of sovereign grace be deaf when I complain? No, still the ear of sovereign grace attends the mourner's prayer. Oh, may I ever find access to breathe my sorrows there. Thy mercy seat is open still. Here let my heart retreat with humble hope attend thy will, and wait beneath thy feet. Continually cry out to God in prayer. He invites you to do so. So pray in the day of trouble, and then wait on him. Second, second. In the day of trouble, honestly address your questions to God. Honestly address your questions to God. Verses 4 through 9. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. Let's pause here for a moment. I want you just to see that agony in the valley is not uniform. Sometimes we're crying aloud to God. Sometimes we're silent. What have we to say? Verse 5. I consider the days of old, the years long ago, I said... Let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Now verse 4 as God holds Asaph's eyelids open, this may be an example of God's, what theologians call God's severe grace, not allowing Asaph sleep until he pushes deeper into this struggle. And so Asaph, still troubled, forges ahead. And he has the right idea in verses 5 through 6. This is what he says, okay, this is what will help. I'm going to remember a happier past when God acted and provided for his people. And I even have a song to accompany those memories that I'm going to sing. But once again, a simple and right action cannot be forced into an easy, quick solution. Because Asaph's soul, his spirit at the end of verse 6, in effect says, hold on. Wait a minute. Yeah, I've got some big questions about the difference between how things were back then and how things feel now. And big questions they are. So he asks in verse 7, You were favorable to Israel in the past, God, and to me. But I don't feel that now. Will you never look to me with favor again? Is your steadfast covenant love that you promised all used up? Has it all been exhausted and there's no more to give out? It's verse 8. Has it slipped your mind, God, how to act in grace and compassion? That's verse 9. Now, all of these questions could be summed up in this way. Have you changed, God, from then to now? Have you changed in your stance toward me have you changed, God? The depth of anguish, you see, comes from reflecting on the difference between the past and the present. Relief by remembering a former joy is not so speedily attained, John Calvin said. Now, don't get me wrong. Memory is a powerful help in the valley. And we're going to get there in step three, but sometimes memory is painful at first. You have to get all your questions out on the table 
before you can move forward. Such questions, like Asaph asks, are not off limits with God. He commands us to cast our cares on Him because He cares for us, and surely this includes confessing our doubts about God to God. And so, when you're in a day of trouble, candidly and honestly ask Him, Lord, isn't this who you are? Because I'm confused. This doesn't reveal a lack of faith, just the opposite. Questions like these aren't asked with the motive of finding fault with God or charging God with wrong, but rather they're asked with the motive of an intent to understand God better. I want to know who you are. Honest doubts addressed to God in this way reflect an openness, a willingness on our part to being taught and reminded and brought back to God's Word. Once questions like these are aired, once we speak them to God, then there's an opportunity to test them against Scripture. So, for example, here, Asaph asks if God has forgotten to be gracious. And Asaph asks God, have you shut up your compassion in anger? But Asaph knows And we know, too, if we know our Bibles well, that the very unchanging character of God, Exodus 34, is that he is a God who is gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness and compassion. When we ask God these questions, when we air them, when we put them out in the open, honestly, we then can begin to reason with ourselves from God's word that such doubts don't ultimately stand up to reality. Derek Kidner puts it this way, as broad misgivings about God are spelt out, that is, as they're given voice, their inner contradictions come to light and with them the possibility of an answer. If steadfast love is pledged in God's character and word, then it can hardly disappear, or his promises come to nothing. So honestly address your questions to God, and then turn to the Bible to help you wrestle with them. And I think when you do that, you'll find that many, if not most of your questions, are actually rhetorical questions, and that they contain their own answer. Has God, has God's steadfast love ceased toward me, his child? Of course not. Of course not. Okay then, Lord, then help me wait on you. Help me to see and to feel your present love in this day of trouble. When our questions have been, uh, have been honestly addressed to God and we're ready to listen to him and to receive his answers, then we can move to the third step. So third, third, in the day of trouble, intently remember who God is and what he has done. Intently remember who God is and what he has done. This is the entire second half of the psalm, verses 10 through 20. So let's read it again. Uh, Because it's a longer section, we're going to pause at a couple places, and I'll make some comments. So just have your finger ready. Verse 10, then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. So Asaph returns to this action of remembering God. And he says, I'm going to appeal to the Years of the right hand of the Most High. To speak of God's right hand is to talk about all the powerful and mighty ways that God has rescued his people throughout the centuries. Whenever the Bible talks about God's right hand or his right arm, it's talking about his power to save his people. And so Asaph commits himself now to remembering the mighty things that God has done throughout the centuries. Keep going, verse 11, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. And so notice here, Asaph is seeking to remember all of the things that God has done, right? All of God's mighty acts in the past. 
Then verse 13, your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God. So not only does Asaph turn his mind to what God has done, but who God is, what his character is like. He is a God who is holy. And what God is great like our God? None. That's the answer. None, because he's holy. Verse 14, you are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. Pause. Now, in the rest of the psalm, from verse 16 forward, Asaph is focusing on one specific instance of God's mighty actions, the Exodus, when God delivered his people from Egypt. Verse 16, when the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. There's an important thing for here, here for us to grasp. Our God is the God who drives fear into anything or anyone who threatens his people in a day of trouble. That's a comforting thought. Keep going, verse 17. The clouds poured out water, the skies gave forth thunder, your arrows flashed on every side, the crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind, your lightnings lighted up the world, the earth trembled and shook, your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So earlier in this psalm, Remembering God was painful for Asaph, but now those same memories recalled at the proper time and with the proper perspective, those same memories become powerful and life-giving. So Asaph has pushed through. He hasn't given up. Now, there's another subtle shift from the first half of Psalm 77 to the second half you may have missed, and it's this. Asaph goes from speaking about God, third person, to speaking to God, second person. It's like his focus shifts from rehearsing his feelings about God to now addressing God directly, who he is and what he has done. Asaph is clearly seeking to anchor his soul to something objective and unchanging and strong. And memory has the power to do this. And so, in your day of trouble, what should you remember? Well, first, remember who God is, just like Asaph does here. Remember who God is. Remember his character. Remember his nature. He is a holy God. There is none like him. Remember that he is omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful. Remember that he is a God who is wise. Remember that he is good. Remember that he is a God full of love and compassion. And how are you to remember all these things? Well, here's just one really practical way to do that. Memorize scriptures that tell you these things about God so that you can remember them and call them to mind when you're in the valley. So you need to remember who God is, but you also need to remember what God has done for his people and what he has done for you. So Asaph here, what he does is he goes back to the Exodus. He recalls God's mighty power at the Exodus, how God swooped down and uh, rescued his people and led them to safety. For us... We have a new and better exodus to remember, the atoning work of Christ, what God did in Christ on the cross. Whenever we are tempted to doubt God's love for us in the valley, whenever we are seeking to find and to feel God's love for us in the day of trouble, the New Testament consistently points us to one place cross of Jesus Christ. That's where God says, see, this is my love for you. I have given you my son. Jesus died to save us from our sin. He rose so that we might be free. He's the one who gives us the hope of an eternal mountaintop joy one day in the future. 
there is great power in remembering the good news of the gospel, rehearsing the fact that God has acted graciously and powerfully and finally in Christ. And if he has done that for you, if God has given you his son, how will he also not with his son graciously give you all things, all that you need for life and godliness, even in the valley? If God is for you in Christ, who can be against you? Nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ. These are the sorts of things we need to remember in the valley, what God has done through his son. Beyond that, count all your blessings. Record your gratitude. Write out all the ways that God has acted in mercy on your behalf. Do what you need to do to remember the gospel and remember what God has done. Do what you're doing this morning joining God's people, and singing about what God has done. That's one way to remember. Now, the key is not just remembering, but remembering intently, intently. Asaph doesn't just recall God's mighty works. He doesn't just write them out on a post-it note that then goes in the trash. He ponders and meditates on them, verse 12. That means he he remembers with eager and earnest attention, not letting these truths about God drift too far from his focus. We are always fighting our proneness to wonder. And so in the valley, we have to constantly feed our minds with such memories and allow them to penetrate deeply into our souls. Because what we're seeking to do in those moments, as we remember God and remember the things that he has done, what we're seeking to do is drown out our doubts about God's nearness with objective realities. This is who he truly is. And we continue to do so even when our feelings lag behind these convictions of faith. And as we remember intently, as we address our questions to God, as we cry out to Him, over time, relief will begin to come. New faith will be mysteriously created. God will show up in surprising and even unforeseen ways. Did you catch that at the very end of our psalm, verse 19? Your footprints were unseen, God. Oh, but he was there, working in all sorts of powerful and transformative ways, leading his people like a flock. We get to the end of the psalm, and we don't know if Asaph's circumstances changed. We don't know. But... It's very clear that his outlook has begun to change because he knows that God's hand is at work. CCC, cling to this God in your day of trouble. Cling to this God when you're in the valley. Persevere in the valley with your mind and your heart and your memory fixed on our great God and what he has done in Christ. Let's pray. And so, Lord, I want to pray right now for those who are in a day of trouble. Would you give them grace and strength to seek after you and to not give up? Be gracious and draw near to them. Give them comfort and relief in your perfect timing. Help all of us to never tire of remembering the demonstration of your great love for us through Jesus. Focus our minds and our hearts on him now and his glorious salvation, we ask. Amen.